Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Discussing a Murderer. This is your host, Jeff Jones, and with me is the panel in some sort of order. Um, and so let's go from the top here and say hello to Dr. Silkman first. Welcome, everyone, and uh, welcome, panel, and welcome, people in chat. It's great to be back. And, uh, and Jeff, uh, a big kudos to you. Um, your uh, Discord channel has really taken off. Very, very impressive and very well deserved. Hey, thanks, Dr. Silkman. I appreciate that. I hope people uh, get on that Discord channel and uh, have a chance to interact with us and other people that are also uh, following along with us as we go through each episode here. So thank you again, Dr. Silkman. Um, Kelly, how are you doing today? Good morning, everyone. Hello, panel. I'm doing very well. It's uh, 6.42 in the morning, Thursday morning here in Western Australia. Um, again, thank, congratulations for the Discord. Uh, it's a good platform to um, meet new people in the community and exchange thoughts. And yeah, thanks for having me back. Of course, Kelly. I don't know how we could move forward without you at this point, but... Uh, you know, Big Jeff, we're at last to say hello today, but I promise you, you'll have first in the wrap-up comments. Uh, I just want to make sure that you're aware of that now. Well, I sure appreciate that, Jeff. I, I never could have saw that coming. Uh, and I'd like to say hello to everyone on the new Discord channel. You know, uh, yeah, it's a pretty small community at the end of the day. And you think you know everybody, but there's people hopping onto that channel who I've never met before. And it's great to uh, be able to interact with them. Uh, and hear different points of view. So uh, hello to everybody, and, and th thanks for having me back. Uh, it's 6.43 p.m. in the People's Republic of Massachusetts, so I'm ready to get cracking. Well, let's crack away then. Uh, this is the concluding portion, or the second half. We're going to start about 35 minutes and 30 seconds into the second half of Episode 7 called Framing Defense. If Link was involved with the transmittal of evidence in 2002, then he probably would have known that this box of Stephen Avery's blood was in that case file. And he would therefore have known in October and November of 2005, when the Hallbach vehicle was discovered on November 5th, he would have known that there was a source of Stephen Avery's blood available in the clerk's office. This is a picture that shows the file in the clerk's office? Correct. And the file actually has the exhibits in it as well as the paper documents, right? Correct. All the exhibits are underneath all the, I think all the paper was pretty much at the top. I mean, and when people go through it, it, it doesn't necessarily end up back in that same condition. And I think when it was kept over on the side filing cabinet, I tried to level things out too. So the cover mm. could kind of, the flaps could come over because I didn't think that was a very secure. Sure. But there is that, see that foam board exhibit in the background. Right. And that would probably stick out no matter yes. where, because it was too big for the yes. box. So right. the box wouldn't close. Right. Okay no matter what you did. If I could just make the comment, and uh, I'm sure the panel members will agree, isn't that remarkable how important uh, documents from the 1985 trial were just all kept in a tub, um, all haphazard, including forensic evidence, right? Including important forensic evidence just shoved in a clerk's office without any care or attention. Uh, to me, that that's a big, big issue. And of course, <laughs> what Butin was trying to imply was that um, <clears throat> anyone had easy access to that material uh, in the clerk's office. You know what I find interesting uh, about that box is that if you if you read the Queso report, right? I mean, Queso reports what a thousand pages. Uh, you know, th how big is a thousand pages? I've read thousand page books, and at the end of the day, you know, they're a couple inches thick. What the hell is all that stuff in there? You know what I mean? <laughs> how, how much stuff did they need uh, to falsely convict Stephen Avery in 1985? What could possibly be all in all those uh, 
know, in all those pages, that's, uh, you know, so, so much that they can't uh, even fit it inside of a gigantic sh uh, shipping container. Uh, probably <laughs> all the statements from the alibi witnesses that <laughs> said where Stephen was that day, and uh, they didn't want you to know about it. Yeah, those are in the bottom drawer. <laughs> that, that's why I've been shredded. <laughs> I think he makes a pretty good case uh, about how haphazardly that the evidence was being stored. And it's, you know, it's it's funny for her to look at the picture and then she says, well, we we don't like to see it like that. Oh, you don't. Well, who did it? You know, someone in your <laughs> relative zone did it. If it wasn't you, it was someone who was trained. You know, it was your neighbor's work. You know what I mean? So it's it's funny to just point out mistakes like that and i just think it's uh it really shows how easily you could have just slipped in slipped out somebody could have grabbed something you know if, if that's what this is being if that's how this box is being held how is every other piece of evidence in their evidence locker being held right that, I this that, is an important case that's that's something that you have to question and uh you know to Link's horror uh his name was uh written down on a piece of paper having direct access to that uh, forensic evidence or that box. Uh, and that's what caused the roller coaster to occur. Isn't that right, Big Jeff? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And I think by the end of this episode, uh, you're just going to have to ask yourself whether or not you believe um, that Stephen Avery, at the point he was in his life, at the point he was in, in the uh, 1985 case, being very successfully prosecuted, uh, making some of the people who he had, uh, you know, direct, uh, you know, lawsuits against, or squirm in their seats, not being able to recall, you know, uncovering the deep injustices that were done in that case, whether or not he picked that time, right, to to rape and murder uh, a, a young photographer, uh, or whether or not that this is a massive uh, case of evidence planting against him. I, I've made my uh, conclusion to myself and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I mean, and again, it doesn't necessarily, if you don't necessarily believe the exact narrative, uh, you know, that the prosecution puts forward, there's plenty of people, so our, our friends, the guilters who say, well, just because the state's narrative isn't matched exactly doesn't mean that the state's case is incorrect. I think you need to say, you know, you need to allow yourself that same leeway with regard to what you might hear for the defense case uh, as we move through the rest of this episode. And, and that is that, uh, you know, if it didn't happen exactly as Dean and Jerry lay it out, that doesn't mean that the evidence wasn't planted either. Right. There's plenty of other ways that it could have happened, uh, you know, for example, at the, at the crime lab. Isn't that right, uh, Dr. Sultan? Yeah, really good point uh, there, Big Jeff. And, uh, you know, I tell you what, you would be worried um, if you were in prison and your material and you were wrongfully um, convicted, if your material from your trial was just placed strewn about in a box and left a re literally abandoned in a clerk's office where people had access to. And my final point is this, and I'm sure the panel and people in chat will agree. Um, the mere fact that that Lenk's name was associated with a document uh, meaning that he was able to have access to that forensic material um, is really worrisome. And it really highlights the point of conflict of interest. And uh, none of this, you realize that none of this would have been a point had Lenk, Colburn, Remica, and all the other MTSO officers had followed the correct example of what they did to the coroner, and that is keep off the Avery salvage yard. That's it. That's all they had to do. Jost Bushman. Yeah, all the MTSO officers, oh. correct. I mean, I just, I have a hard time, and I know I said this maybe last episode, but I have a hard time when people want to use that word integrity, say, I, no one should question my integrity. I've never had my integrity questioned yet. When I'm in a deposition in a civil lawsuit, and then the subject of that, person who's suing me is now the focus of a missing persons investigation and later a murder trial, I fail to tell anyone about that. Is that someone with integrity? Doesn't sound like to me. I rest my case. Definitely, on definitely not, Jeff. Definitely not. hundred percent correct. Correct. This was um, a pure gold mine for Stephen Avery's defense. Say that the presence of Sheriff's deputies 
inside the interior part of that clerk's office. It's not that unusual an event, right? That's correct. Now, in addition, the sheriff's department has access to the clerk's office with master keys. Isn't that right? The security bailiffs would. Okay. A master key would allow entry to the inner part of the clerk's office, right? I guess. So. Okay. And that would include after hours on weekends or in the evenings, right? Correct. I just love where he's going there. He's building a case for reasonable doubt or reasonable suspicion, I guess we could say in this case. Well, um, actually, Kelly, uh, now probably is a good time to mention a certain phone call, right? <laughs> Do you remember that phone call, Kelly? Uh, that was with the Herman brothers. Um, it's at, I think it's around five o'clock, just before five o'clock in the morning of the six. Um, just before, obviously, the blood is discovered in the RAV. And they're talking about getting into a locked administration building and going behind a door that they can't get to. Um, very, very interesting call. Could it be nefarious? Absolutely. Could it be not nefarious? Absolutely. It's just the timing of it. And I've always considered that because Jerry and Dean used the blood vial um, narrative in terms of trying to debunk the blood in the RAV, I think that if they would have been aware of this phone call, I think that could have been really powerful to kind of use in court to kind of show the parallels of what were they doing at that time in the morning to get into an administration building and kind of like planting the seed for the jurors to see that this was could have been the opportunity window. Um, you know, this that, that particular phone call I think would have seeded some doubt and potentially could have meant that anyone could have had access to that office out of hours when obviously the secretarial staff were not there. So I think that uh, is a very powerful uh, element to bring into trial. Lieutenant Herman. Hey, I'm just asking if you were still out there. Yeah. Um, I think I'm going to do, you don't have a key to uh, get into, uh, I can't get into the administrative block there. I can get in the office, but I can't get into, uh, you can't get past the door. No. Okay, I'm going to come in and uh, get a credit card. Um, but I'm thinking, right now we just have Scott out there, correct? Yeah, what, is he just security at, by the command yeah, post, or what? By the command post, something. If somebody needs something out there, I want to see somebody from that, I want to call him. Sure. Um, when I listen to the Herman brothers talk, I mean, it's we we know right that that the uh, police are well aware that the lines upon which that they they are talking, the dispatch lines, uh, are being recorded. Uh, and it, and to me, when you listen to that call, it's just obvious that they're going out of their way not to say things. And you just have to ask yourself, why why is that? Um, you know, you hear the dispatch calls all the time. Can you give me a call myself? Can you give me a call myself? when the cell is a perfect way to avoid what's being recorded. But the reason that these lines are recorded in the first place is because they are evidentiary, uh, which, which says to me um, that, uh, you know, that, that the uh, police call records themselves also ought to be evidentiary, if, especially if they're using them to try and circumvent the fact that they're being recorded. Uh, so where these calls came from, the ping locations, uh, as well as um, you know the the, the timing information minimally should be of evidentiary value uh, and and part of uh, open open records requests uh, and and I, and I don't think that they are to my to my knowledge but uh, my point uh, sorry I buried my point which was when you listen to the call listen to the way they talk to each other it's pretty obvious that they're that they're going out of their way to not say specific things which they are perhaps concerned about being recorded and that's highly suspicious. That seems suspicious. Yeah. That people ain't gonna get away with everything. No. No. That's why Kraft is worried about it. Yeah. You know, he's scared now. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, I wouldn't be. Mm. Dolores, how's Stephen yeah. doing? How is he doing? Can you come in? Hi. 
You know, look at the contrast between what Ma, Mama Avery did compared to what Stephen Avery did when it came to talking to the press, right? Stephen couldn't help himself and kept on talking, whereas Mama Avery was very focused, very determined, and didn't say a thing, just went straight to her car, which is the right thing to do, in my opinion. Hundred percent, Tony. Uh, I think you know they, they. I think Stephen actually got asked about this at one point, um, and uh, his his sort of incorrect conclusion that that you and I would agree is that he stayed quiet in 1985, and you know he felt that he didn't get his message out, and uh, so the, the reason that he felt that he was talking to the to the media in particular, um, you know Laura Riccardi and, and even some of the interviews that he that he did with like Emily Matezik and others. It's like, I, I got to get my side of the story out because, uh, you know, other, otherwise nobody's going to hear it. I mean, I, I don't I don't think he helped himself either way, to be honest, but um, especially because he's not a very good communicator or storyteller. Um, but uh, staying quiet is the is the right thing to do. And I'm glad my Avery was able to do it. Yeah. Kudos to my Avery for doing that. Can you touch us at all today? When blood is taken for a blood sample or blood tests, it's put in a purple top tube. It has a preservative to keep it from spoiling, and that's a chemical called EDTA. We do not have EDTA in our own bloodstream. If you find it in a stain, the argument is it must be because the blood was planted. And so I looked into could we test the stains in the RAV4 to try and make any kind of scientifically valid conclusion about whether or not the, the blood stain could have come from a tube, a preserved blood, as opposed to an actively bleeding person. And there was nobody who did those tests anymore. But then the state somehow managed to get the FBI to create such a test and have it ready sometime in the middle of the trial. I mean, before they even unpack this, like, here's another instance where Judge Willis is willing to allow a brand new test. Well, the um, the last time the FBI uh, used an EDTA test um, had tragic consequences. They used the EDTA testing uh, in the OJ Simpson trial uh, and essentially uh, d detecting EDTA is not an easy thing to do. Uh, it's a chemical, uh, it's a man-made chemical, and it's potentially found absolutely everywhere. Uh, it's used in all sorts of industries. Uh, in And uh, Kelly will back me up. Uh, it's also used in purple top tubes uh, as an anticoagulant. So essentially when you draw blood, uh, when a phlebologist uh, withdraws blood from your vein, uh, it normally goes into a purple top tube. And that purple top tube contains uh, EDTA, which is an anticoagulant. It essentially keeps the blood in a liquid state. Now, you're correct, Jeff. The FBI do not routinely test for EDTA because it's an extremely difficult test to do. Uh, when they used it in uh, the trial, the OJ Simpson trial, uh, they made a huge mistake. Um, essentially, they didn't properly flush 
the machine that they were using to test for EDTA. And as a result, some of the EDTA got washed uh, into the blood sample that they found at the crime scene. And as a result, they found evidence of trace amounts of EDTA. So in, in essence, that proved to OJ's defense team that, oh, the blood had to have been planted. Uh, to their horror, uh, the FBI discovered many years later, I believe, that they didn't properly flush out their machine. So the test was abandoned. Lo and behold, out of the blue, um, the state now called upon the FBI using Dr. LeBeau to do a brand new um, EDTA testing. So they basically had to restart from the beginning. And I'll tell you right now, I've read the original documents. I don't believe Judge Willis believed at all in the EDTA results. And what's remarkable is this. Uh, when, the, when the defense found that EDTA tube, that blood tube, guess what the state did? The state put in a notion to block any analysis of that blood. They wanted to block the blood vial, right? So initially they put in um, filings or motions to block the discovery of that blood vial. Then they decided they were going to use the FBI in order to detect the presence or absence of EDTA in the swabs from the RAV4, which was unbelievably sneaky. And you could tell here Norm Garn already knew what the results were going to be. That's why he was supremely confident. I don't know if Kelly wants to make any comments about that, but uh, yeah, this was really, really devious by the state. You honestly summed it all up. Everything that I would have said, you just said. So yeah, the blood vial. I'm sitting here with the blood vial, my blood vial right now, just twirling it around my fingers. Um, I was actually kind of morose, going to, Kelly. <laughs> I was actually going to try to do something. Um, I was going to try to take my camera off. I have some questions coming from the perspective of a uh, of, of a layman who doesn't know anything about uh, BDTA or blood, but has a passing knowledge of statistics. Uh, and my, so my question is, um, uh, Dr. Silkin, I apologize to, to, hit it, to, to quizzing you out of the blue, uh, is um, with regard to that EDTA test, it sounds like the problem with EDTA is not so much the, pro the probability of detection, but it sounds like the probability of false alarm is very high with the, with the, with the EDTA. Uh, well, yeah, of, yeah, go ahead. One, one of the big issue, issues with EDTA, and we'll talk about this in a minute when the, Dr. LeBeau comes on, is that EDTA is, is literally absolutely everywhere. Uh, it's in car cleaning products. It's in shampoo. Uh, it's present in the environment. So the question is you can potentially get false positives and false negatives. That's why the FBI do not bother testing EDTA. It's not a routine test, right? And as we'll get to see in a moment, you can definitely fool the FBI. Uh, Cherie Cohane could have easily fooled the FBI by simply swapping swabs, right? And as we'll discover, to our absolute horror, the FBI never went back to the RAV4 and swabbed it de novo, Big Jeff. They just simply relied on the swabs that were given to them by the Wisconsin State Crime Lab. And my final point is this. Even if you don't detect EDTA, it doesn't mean that it wasn't there. It means that your setup that you have used in the laboratory uh, was not sensitive enough. And Dr. LeBeau actually admitted that their instruments had a cutoff point. So that meant that if the EDTA was quite low in concentration, their machine would not detect it. Okay, my front one won't work. It says it's offline, so I said, did a reversal. So da, 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 da. we have the purple top. Oh, it's beautiful. So can you guys see the liquid still flowing? Yeah, we Correct. can see it. 
we can definitely see it. So this yeah, we is can the purple see drop. It. This has literally been um, liquid, been in liquid form since the I think it was the eighteenth of December of twenty twenty. And have a go out of it. Look how rich it is still of mm. of my blood. Look at that. Can absolutely. you see the flow? Absolutely. Yeah. Until that's effective EDTA on that's blood. That's effective. So this is an interesting um, situation. So I, when I first had this blood and the vial, um, it was full. I did a full, well, as much as we could. And what happened was when I was doing all my experiments, I kind of used majority of it. So what happened was when I started to intervene, like intravenous myself and have just natural like flowing blood out of my arm, um, when I had blood left over in the syringe, I would add it to this vial and the vial would turn that blood into EDTA blood even a year later. So this yes. is, this is shows you how active it can be. The fact that it's still after all this time, you can, I can add fresh blood into it as of now, if I really wanted to, and it would still, and I just want to show everyone just, I really wanted to show everyone how really simple this is. Watch this. It's just a matter of pop. Did you hear that? It's oh, uh, I heard you like, say pop. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, that was not convincing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Let's try another take. Let's see if we can hear that pop, pop. That would be nice. Can you hear the crunch? Yeah, it's on tight. Hang on. The crunch is the blood, blood flakes falling on me. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> It, because it's all dry blood in the crease. It's dry. Yeah, it's yeah. dry. And you can hear it. Hang on, let me. So you're saying that's co that's common, Kel, for um, for for the for the fact that the syringe may have been tipped on its side or whatever for blood to begin to seep into the uh, seal between the top and the yeah. and the oh, side. So that, that's can... that's perfectly normal. It's really hard to see because it's um I don't want to. Hang on, off. Oh, you have no, no idea we, how dicky it is right now. No, we we can right smell now. it. We 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 can. <laughs> not I'm we can see, smell. It. We can see it. <laughs> I'm gonna see if I can turn on my flashlight and see if that does that make it a bit better for you guys. Yes, we can see it. So all in there, it's it's all crusted from where the blood has sat for a while. So if I turn this over, I'm not sure if you guys can see it, but. Remember how I said that there should be a hole in there, but there, for my one, I think it's because, like we spoke about before, it's so it, these tube tops are now more advanced than 1980. Was so, yeah, was so although you can see where it was possibly like where you put the needle in, um, there's no hole, it's it's clear as hell. It's all so sealed up. There. Yeah, sealed. Now, now, wasn't that blood vial supposedly the one that they used to do the DNA exonerations? So that would have been from 2003. No, right? no, 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 okay. no, 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 no. That blood was used in 1996 by LabCorp, right? And the exoneration was not done using blood. It was actually done using a buckle swab, right? So in, 19, in 1996, that blood vial was actually used by LabCorp in order to extract genomic DNA. Uh, after that uh, was done, that blood vial was returned um, to the state uh, laboratory and kept in a box, in a styrofoam box. It was then reopened by the Innocence Project, right? So, But no additional blood was taken. The only people that took blood from that blood vial after was the FBI by Dr. Lebeau. And, and just one more, do you, you know that because of the evidence uh, sign-out sheets? Is that, is that yeah, how we know um, that? Yeah, yes. I found okay. all the original documents. I've read all the original documents. I actually did a presentation on EDTA, uh, which is a, available on our Foul Play uh, YouTube site, where I, I looked at all the experiments that were done uh, using the EDTA protocol. And I'll tell you what, it's, a, it's an eye-opener for sure. That blood, you've got to remember, I believe was nine years old when tested by the FBI. 
So it was not fresh blood by any stretch of the imagination. No one has tested for EDTA in blood that was that old. And, and what and what is the, the typical concentration of EDTA required to keep the blood in its liquid form? Is it uh, well? That, is it, that's an, is it one one in ten thousand? One in a thousand? Well, articles? that's an. And um, I, I can't. I have to get my uh, my um, uh, presentation to get the amount. But essentially, there's a huge. They put in a huge amount of EDTA in a purple top tube. In fact, it's in excess. And if you ask Kelly, sometimes you can see it as a white powder in the bottom of the tube. So as you add blood, it actually dissolves the EDTA uh, into solution and hence prevents the blood from clotting. What's interesting, and Kelly uh, demonstrated it beautifully, if you add more fresh blood to that tube, it remains in liquid form. And the reason why is because you've got a huge amount of unbound EDTA still present in that tube. So in a purple top tube, uh, Big Jeff, they add the EDTA in excess, right? So say you only require five units of EDTA to keep the blood in liquefied form. In a tube, they might put 100 units, right? They add excess EDTA. That was okay. excellent. Oh, oh, so go ahead, Kelly. I'll ask after. Oh, my apologies. I was just um. So what I've done is I've just opened my tube. I've got a dropper. I put a little bit up. I put a drew up a little bit of blood, and literally, all you have to do is you can you can control it. So when I did my experiments, you can. Watch this, just a little. Firstly, I want you to see, see that tiny little bit right there at the tip that I'm able to draw? Yeah. See it coming down? Look how much you're able to create with just this little drip. Ready? This little bit of blood. And what is that thing that you're, that you're using to drop it called? It's just a dropper. But if you can see here, oh, where is it? This is the blood. I'm not sure why it's 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 trying hard to focus because it's such a white. And you can just yeah. Just oh blood my! It. Well, how do you want it to look? It basically, however you want it to look, and you yeah. just do it with the tip. So I was able to do that with the ignition. I was able to create the pattern of the ignition with the tip. And yeah. as you can see, look how much you can create with just that tiny, tiny little drip that uh, droplet uh, kelly is approximately 50 microliters so that goes to show and kelly just beautifully demonstrated the amount of blood you needed to see that rav was under half a mil of blood so you see the blood that she's got in that uh droplet in that dropper that's all you need to have uh, reproduce what you saw in that rav that's it you don't need a huge amount just one drop of four, about two minutes, and you're done. In, out, you've seeded the rav, you walk away. Yeah. And so, so the the question that I was going after, Doctor Silkman, was the fact that you know if if um, EDTA only binds to the level of sort of say one part in a thousand, and you've got fifty microliters in there, right? Then you're you're talking about fifty na fifty nanoliters. <laughs> that's a tremendously small amount of uh, of EDTA that you're that you're actually looking for, and one wonders whether the concentration of EDTA, sort of in the material that the that the uh, the, the RAV itself is made out of, the the dash uh, is more than the concentration that you'd expect to find in that um, you know in that drop. Yeah, what's what what is disconcerting for me, Big Jeff, is the fact that uh, the uh, FBI. Uh, didn't go and, and re-swab the RAV de novo, right? They relied on other officers to do the control swabbing as well, which is rather bizarre because normally what the FBI do is they should have gone in, subpoenaed the RAV and done their own swabs de novo. But I think what Kelly eloquently demonstrated right there in front of all of us 
and people in chat, of course, was how easy it is to add blood to something, right? Uh, and the EDTA keeps the blood in liquefied form. So, you know, that sort of counteracts the uh, sink theory that the blood actually came from the sink. Because if you're going to get blood from a sink when Stephen Avery uh, allegedly bled in his own sink, it means that you needed to get the blood really rapidly and have access to the RAV4, right? So that makes it a very complicated and dicey thing to do. Whereas if you've got blood in this form, uh, it's portable, right? Kelly has had the, her own blood, I think, in that tube for nearly two years. And it's still in liquefied form and you can still uh, use it in a dropper to put it anywhere that you want, right? So I think that eloquently shows how easy it was to add blood to that RAV4. Okay, so see this blood here on my, because this is what I use. So this is, I don't want to get too much into it because it's a totally blood thing, but I picked this um, container that I use because it was, when I went down and spoke to the um, car detail people, they said to get a panel, in Australia, you can't just go get panels. It's, it's scrapped. It's it's very different. So I'm like, help me. What else could I use? And they said, listen, there's probably things around your house you can use. You're looking for the same texture and the same material, which is it's a hard plastic. Basically, that's what your um, paneling is in your car. It's just a really hard plastic. And you want one that has like that um, smooth glossiness. So you don't want any material that will soak in blood because that's not what happens in a car. Apologies if I'm echoing. I am in a bathroom, um, so that's why I'm <laughs> echoing. So I use this because, funny enough, what color would you say that is, everyone? Have a look at this. What color would you say that is? <laughs> oh, no. I'm sorry. Class. Mystic, uh, mystic, <laughs> mystic, mystic Teal Mika. The longer I'm I glad look you at said it, that. It changes. Because... I want you just to keep an eye on it while I'm I'm going to do what I have to do first, then I'm going to go offline, then I'm going to come back and show you something when I change the lighting to what it does. So, um, again, this blood stain here has been from my experiment over a year ago and it's still there and that's yeah. EDTA blood. Yeah. So all I want is going to just show you guys a bit of a sneak peek is basically just show you how absolutely hang on let me just get rid of the drabs simple it is to drop yeah and gravity so you have to do and then gravity when the time is right I, i'll be yeah. honest with you when i did my experiment i actually did it measuring and you'll see it in my videos where i had the gravity on the right angle because i am able to control it um, and yep. I did a measurement of my car and then I came back and did it by ruler and you'll see the ruler and how I did it. And then gravity will, will just basically do its own thing. Um, there's a bubble in it. That's why it's, um, let me just, there we go. Yeah, gravity bubble. takes over. So gravity will take over. So that is absolutely wet as hell right now. What we might do is um, let's leave this here. And then we'll continue with our podcast. And then at the end of the podcast, let's come back and see what EDTA is looking like. Because in an hour's time, we'll see whether it's dry, what, what conditions it, it's in. So, we'll so would, would, would fresh blood behave differently? Oh, fresh blood is completely different. Absolutely and utterly different to the point within five minutes Put it this way. I'll show you one more thing. Um, uh, let's have a look. Okay, so here's a bit here. And you can see that it's still wet. In um, fresh blood, that would almost be peeling by now. It, the, it, it the, coagulates so quick. It's yeah, insane. Yeah, that's the big difference, Big Jeff. Uh, in fresh blood, you've got the coagulation well, still factor still active. Correct. And so in fresh blood, um, you've got those coagulation factors which are going to take over, which means that the blood is going to start to congeal uh, and it's not going to be in the liquefied form. 
as you can see what Kelly was able to do, she was still able to spread that blood, the EDTA blood, because there no the coagulation factors are not working because the, the calcium is bound by the EDTA, which means the coagulation cascade is not working. In fresh blood, you've got no EDTA, which means that you're going to get a coagulation cascade, right? Because when you cut yourself, normally you don't bleed to death, depending on how big the cut is. If you, if you just do a minor cut on your skin and you have blood coming out, you can see that within a couple of minutes, it starts to solidify because what it's doing is, is it's forming a soft clot and then in time it will form a hard clot and be very, very crusty. You're not going to get any of that with EDTA blood, right, because the coagulation factors are not working, so the blood is going to stay in liquefied form. Well, well, this is a wonderful education. So, thank you. I apologize for holding everybody up for my for my silly questions, but but this is what, what a wonderful no, not opportunity for an education. This is. And how lucky are we that Kelly's doing a live demonstration uh, from a purple top tube? You can't <laughs> get any better than that. I want you just to observe the color. You'll see me do it live. I've got my phone here. I'm adding a flash to it. Oh yeah. And then let's bring it up. Turns to blue. Correct. Well, wow. that's a really good demonstration. Turns to blue with a flash. It looks a blue on the camera. Blue. It Look looks the green on this camera. That's really something. Correct. And that's exactly what we see with the RAV4. And that's why a lot of people believe that there were, in actual fact, two RAV4s. That's not the case. There was always one. The color, the Mystic Teal Mika, that actually changes color depending on the lighting conditions. How are you going to deal with the issue that in December you were told this was going to take four to six months, which would have been way too late to present at this trial, and then all of a sudden they got it done in a couple of days? Well, it wasn't a couple of days. I, I think... Um... I, I don't see it as a problem. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. What, what a scientific answer that was. Wow. I, don't I feel overwhelmed, overwhelmed by science. <laughs> well, who's, who's, what, who wants to contrast like the conversation in the last half an hour? It was, with, uh, I don't see a problem. <laughs> yeah. It was pure garbage. That's what it was. This is a bit speculative, but had the FBI not been able to expedite that testing so quick, would it the trial have just gone on with without these test results? Yes. Now can I? Thanks, Norm. Go. Thank you. Run, Norm, run. <laughs> Thank you. Because I'm chomping at the bit. All right. I don't know why. <laughs> oh, I'm happy to be here. You know this this case, as unusual as it has been already, has now become even more unusual and unique because it's the first and only time anywhere in the country where an expert is being allowed to express an opinion about EDTA being on a blood stain or not when there's a challenge. The only other time it's ever come in at all was the OJ case and both sides agreed to it. Here, uh, this judge is the first judge who's ever ruled this kind of test to be admissible. But the jury is still going to hear these results. Yes, they are. And that's unfortunate. The, you know, we'll do our best to explain to the jury why they shouldn't be relied upon. You know, we'll, we'll see what happens on that. You know, I always get my chances for, you know, I'm going to get out and then this, this stuff comes and I can just see that they're trying to do their damnedest to keep me in. So, you know, this. It's scary. Come down to it. Dr. LeBeau, did you know that this was a case that involved an allegation of police planting evidence? Yes, I did. 
Why would a case such as that, an allegation of law enforcement officers planting evidence, be of a concern to the FBI? Well, one of the, the areas that the FBI is responsible for investigating is in this country is crimes of public corruption. If an individual is truly in that political position or in a, a law enforcement position and they are doing something illegal that erodes the public's trust in that agency or that individual. And we would want that, certainly that individual, out of that office or off the street. Now I'd like to ask you, doctor, what was your thought process in approaching this case that was sent to you? There's going to be one or two scenarios when you're dealing with the notion that blood was planted from an EDTA tube. The first scenario is that if you find the presence of EDTA on that blood stain, then that's an indication that that blood came from a tube, such as a purple top tube. The other scenario is that you do not find EDTA, and that would then suggest that the blood came from active bleeding and not from an EDTA preserved tube. Were you able to reach a conclusion concerning the presence of EDTA on the blood swabs that you tested from Teresa Hallbach's RAV4 that were sent to you in this case? Yes, sir. When we were not able to identify any indication of the presence of EDTA in any of the swabs that were submitted to our laboratory and were reported to us as being collected from the RAV4. Do you hear what Dr. LeBeau says? said from the swabs that were submitted. That is crucial. It is. A, it's a little bit of a word game there, but I, I, I see where you're going with that. And that's spot on that they're being very vaguely specific. Well, but they didn't go test the rab. That's what Dr. Silk was saying, right? They, they didn't correct. go and test the rab themselves, right? They, that, they they took the ones that Sherry took, took them. She could have swabbed her own butt for all of them. <laughs> That's correct. You know, the, the incredible thing is this, right? Uh, normally, if you're doing um, impartial scientific testing, uh, you don't believe in anything. Remember what he just said. He said, we're, we're dealing potentially here with corruption. Corruption in office. Now, think about this, right? Stephen's defense team is alleging that there was corruption uh, in terms of the MTSO officers planting forensic evidence. Well, the Wisconsin State Crime Lab works for the state, right? So hence, if someone in the state crime lab is also corrupt, you're not going to know, right? So hence, to alleviate all of that, and I'm sure Kelly and Big Jeff will back me up, to alleviate all of that, what the FBI should have done is, hey, we're going to subpoena the RAV4. We're going to do our own independent laboratory testing, whereby there's no bias. We are going to do double-blind testing, which means that the analyst has no idea what samples are what, you're going to find out something that's going to blow your mind. Dr. LeBeau admitted that the laboratory analyst knew what the samples were, right? The analyst knew which were the samples from allegedly the RAV4 and which ones were controls. So if you're a scientist, all you got to do is keep on tweaking the machine until you get the result you want. Guys, do you understand? That's the problem of not having double-blind testing. The analyst knew what the samples were. Cherie Cohen knew what she was swabbing, right? So all Cohen had to do, as Big Jeff said, all she had to do was swap three swabs from Stephen Avery's uh, vehicle, that was in the garage that she swabbed as well, uh, the Pontiac Grand Dam, the FBI would find no EDTA. And that's the shell game. That's how simple it is to fool the FBI. Big Jeff, what do you think? I, you know, I, 
it's very revealing. Um, you know, I've argued in previous podcasts that uh, you know it, I, I don't I don't think it's the right thing that the that any crime lab uh, should be aware of the of the desired result of the test. So to me, it clearly shows that there's a potential for bias when LeBeau admits in the first case that he knew that this was to address a, a potential uh, case of uh, corruption. police corruption. Correct. So yeah, so so that that to me says okay, well we're we're already starting down a bias route to, uh, route to start with. I, I you know, as you say that the, the, in the double blind scenario, you don't know whether you're getting a real uh, swab or a control swab, so you can't you can't uh, you know uh, manipulate the dials on the machinery to get what you want because you don't know what you need in the double That's blind correct. test. So correct. yeah, I, I I think I think I get what you're saying, and boy, it's it is shocking uh, that they knew which one was the controls. So correct. Wow. So norm so normally what you would do, say there were ten swabs, you label them one to ten, and you have a key. So the person who took the swabs knows exactly what those swabs were. You don't tell that information to the operator of the machine. You say you've got ten samples run them through your machine, run them through your protocol, give me the results, we'll put them in the table, and then we'll reveal what is what. That's double-blind testing. It means that the operator has no idea what those samples are. So what you get is what you get. Yes, you run a series of control samples as well, but they are all revealed at the end. That way you know that you're not manipulating the machine to give you the results that you want. You get true results, you analyze them at the end, and then you draw a conclusion. The way this whole experiment was done, uh, you're left with a lot of criticism, and rightly so. A reasonable degree of scientific certainty whether the blood stains from Teresa Halbach's RAV4 that you tested came from the vial of blood of Stephen Avery that was in the Manitowoc County Clerk of Court's office. It's my opinion that the blood stains that were collected from the RAV4 could not have come from the EDTA tube uh, that was provided to us in this case. You think this is vindication? Yes, I clearly believe it's vindication. You know, here are two officers who are accused of something just terrible. That's terrible that they would plant evidence and try and frame someone and basically ignore whoever it may have been that uh, murdered Teresa Halbach. I mean, what an awful thing to do. It would be to the family of Teresa Halbach, to Teresa Halbach. Sturdy thing to think about or even conceive. It's clear vindication and it's just something welcome to all of the law enforcement community because it's just it's such a despicable allegation that's that's all i can say and i think that this testing uh cleared that issue up and um cleared it up uh, uh, in a very very strong powerful way uh, that, that goes to show how uh, they rolled the dice with the uh, uh fbi testing that uh, blood those swabs and it goes to show how important those results were for the state, right? Because as you can see, and you can quite clearly see Norm Garn was giving all these um, uh, smiles and smirks. You could clearly tell that he was extremely nervous here. So to me, uh, those EDTA results were done in order to clear the police officers, right? But again, it now has opened them up to a lot of potential criticism. Uh, and you can see that um, Buting is really going to go after Dr. LeBeau. Yeah, this, this is just incredible what they, what they managed to get away with. And the, and the thing is that you, to, to be able to understand this, um, you, you really do need um, to, to have some level of understanding of you know, probability, mathematics, uh, you know, uh, biology, uh, you know, you, you, you do need some type of specialization, it seems to me. Otherwise, oh, you yeah, it's, it's just not uh, understandable uh, to the, the layman. And I wonder how much Judge Willis himself 
actually could possibly have understood, um, you know, regarding the types of things that he was that he was seeing. Judge Judge Willis never considered the EDTA. He was, um, I think, he wrote a, um, some type of a memo. Um, he wasn't too convinced about the EDTA one way or the other. He didn't trust the uh, EDTA results. Well, this is Judge Willis. But the problem is, if you're a jury and you're listening to this, it's very, very powerful because essentially what they're saying is, hey, we didn't find any EDTA, which means it's got to be fresh blood, right? Which means it couldn't have been Lang, Colburn or anybody else uh, walking around with a vial of blood, right? So the EDTA testing is not as black and white as Norm Garn wants to put it, right? There are definitely a lot of uh, downsides to the, the way the FBI did their testing. And again, all it is, is you've got to fool the jury. You've got to convince the jury, and that's all it takes. Look how quickly they got the FBI to retool their instruments, recalibrate everything, do these internal validation studies they're going to claim. Um, and get results within a matter of weeks, a few weeks, on a test that's, that they haven't done for 10 years. And yet, the crime lab has, in 2002, evidence in, in its lab that Stephen Avery is innocent, and it sits for a year before it gets tested. It shows the imbalance between the individual and the power of the government, the full force of which they're trying to bring to bear on this man. Why? And why in this case? Because we have accused, and the evidence suspiciously points to, framing by one of them. And when you do that, you do so at your peril, as the state would say. You know? Hopefully, though, the jury's going to see that there's this imbalance in the way that they're prosecuting this case and investigating this case. And I think what's going on here, it's its not, again, it's not like they think they are framing an innocent man. But they are. They think he's guilty. And they're doing whatever they can you know, to twist the evidence or, or create a case that supports that. I don't know about that, Jerry, because what I think is that Stephen Avery needed to go away. Uh, because because his lawsuit was unraveling the power structure uh, and really bringing a lot of people into the light, wanted to scurry around in the shadows. And that's why he needed to go away. And it wasn't that they thought he was guilty at all. It was because he needed to go away. This is a setup from the beginning. I agree with you, Big Jeff. Um, Stephen Avery's uh, civil lawsuit uh, had the ability to damage a lot of people. Uh, bring expose a lot of the corruption that was happening in Wisconsin. It would have definitely put the spotlight on people like uh, Kasserik, Vogel, uh, the practices of the MTSO, uh, and other historical cases uh, under the watch of uh, Kasserik, including the Rick Hochschletter case, right, which was a very, very sore point uh, for the MTSO. Um, and clearly, clearly, um, I agree with you, Big Jeff. Beautifully put, Stephen Avery had to go at all costs. You testified about why the FBI would have any interest in this case in the first place. Recall that? Yes, I do. You testified that one of the FBI's concerns was that if there's a corrupt cop on the street doing something illegal and certainly planting evidence to frame somebody would be illegal, right? Would you agree with me? Yes, I would. Okay. And that one of the functions of the FBI was to, to ferret out bad cops like that, right? Generally, that's what I, yes. Okay. Generally, that's what okay. I said, yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 479. Would you read the sentence on top of page two? It discusses the purpose of this request for your services. 
The purpose of this request is to establish the presence of EDTA in the vial of blood, thereby eliminating the allegation that this vial was used to plant evidence. Okay. Can you show me anywhere in there where that request says, our purpose is also to find out if there might be any evidence that there's a corrupt cop in Manitowoc County? Well, I don't see anything. I mean, he's kind of got him right there, yo. I mean, he's saying, you say you're here to investigate to see if there's a crooked cop. You do one test, it turns out, and you didn't poke around anything else? Uh, yeah, correct, correct. And also, there was a mistake. It wasn't a test for the presence of EDTA in a blood vial. It was the test for the presence of EDTA on swabs. Note the difference on swabs that were handed over by the Wisconsin State Crime Lab, right? Now, I know that the FBI then uh, used the uh, blood volume from 1996 to detect the presence of EDTA, and they actually had problems detecting the EDTA. So when they did their setup, certain dilutions from that blood vial did not give a result, which meant that their procedure was wonky from the start. Now, you're only going to know that if you read their, I think it was like a 300-page report, which I went through, that they had trouble with the testing procedure itself. Now, in a, in a court of law, you're not going to go through a 300-page document you're just going to give a summary of the findings. And remember, guys, the FBI never tested this procedure on blood that was nine years old. And the irony is, and I read their report, uh, when they prepared blood samples, they gave it a shelf life of two years. That's how much they can guarantee their results. Blood that was two years old. The blood that was being tested, allegedly, was nine years old. No one had done EDTA testing from blood that was that old. And remember, Kelly showed you, they could have taken a drop of blood from the EDTA vial and diluted it. Right? They could have diluted it. They could have done things to it, etc., etc. All they needed to do was to get blood in a vial, in a stopper, and add it to the RAV. That's all they had to do. And that's why, if you have a look at Dr. LeBeau, he's extremely arrogant. He doesn't like being questioned by beauting. You could tell. Thing of that nature. Is homicide of a citizen in the state of Wisconsin a federal crime? No, sir, it's not. Okay. Is mutilation of corpse in the state of Wisconsin a federal crime? No. Okay. So... The purpose of you getting your federal agency involved in this state crime was to eliminate the allegation that this vial was used to plant evidence. Isn't that true? No, sir. If I can elaborate, I'd be happy to explain. You can elaborate later, sir. You only tested three swabs that were reported to have been found in the Teresa Halbach vehicle, right? That's correct. Do you know how many other stains were also found in that vehicle? No, I don't. Your opinion that there's no EDTA in the swabs from the Halbach vehicle then is limited to the three swabs that were presented to you. Isn't that right? Could you repeat that? You expressed an opinion a little more I'm sorry to stop it, but I'm like, maybe we should have someone explain this to you because well, we just spent a couple minutes on it and I got it. Like, I figured it out. You explained it to me. Now, this guy can't even and he's the expert. He's the, well, he's the FBI agent. It's just it's laughable. Je yeah, but you just wait what he says. This is going to blow your socks off. When I heard what Dr. LeBeau said, I could see J. Edgar Hoover rolling around in his grave. Have a listen to what Dr. LeBeau says. 
more broadly than perhaps you intended to, I believe, which was that the bloodstains in the Hallbach vehicle could not have come from the purple vial that you tested, right? That's correct. But you're, you're actually referring only to the three stain swabs that you tested, correct? No, I believe my original testimony is what I meant. Are you telling me right now that even though you never tested three other swabs of separate blood stains found elsewhere in the RAV4 vehicle, that you're willing to express an opinion that th none of those three swabs have EDTA either? I believe that to be true within a reasonable degree of scientific certainty, yes. Think about what he just said. Now, we know mm -hmm. that there, are, there, are six, there were six uh, droplets of blood and blood flakes uh, found in that RAV4 that ultimately Cohane showed that it was uh, Stephen Avery who had left that blood, those blood droplets, right, in the RAV4. What he just alluded to was, even though I didn't test the other three swabs, I'm drawing a conclusion that there were no EDTA present in those three swabs that I didn't test. How on earth... Unbelievable. And how on earth can any scientist reach a conclusion on material that they never, ever tested? That is phenomenal. He should have been sanctioned, probably even fired, for making a statement like that in a court, and he's from the FBI. Just unbelievable that he could, you know, uh, render that as a scientific opinion as opposed to just an opinion. Because that's what it was, an opinion, not a, not a scientific one. Correct. Uh, but, <laughs> and that, Correct. Is, that is stunning. Stunning. So Absolutely. It's like, it's like Schrodinger's cat, right? right? You've got three boxes in front of you. Is the cat alive or dead? They're all dead. <laughs> They're all dead. <laughs> They're all dead. But, They're I'm all dead. The, but I'm not testing the box. So I don't need to test able, it. <laughs> he was able to derive a conclusion on samples that he never tested. And he probably charged the state for it as well. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Crazy, right? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's unbelievably unprofessional. I mean, uh, how, how he could be allowed to make a statement like that without some type of sanction is just unbelievable. 100% correct. Yep. And mind you, this is the FBI that did the testing on three swabs that were provided by the Wisconsin State Crime Lab and they didn't even do the forensic testing themselves. And the control swabs was done by, I believe, a Calumet officer who did control swabbing. I have never heard of a case whereby the FBI re were totally reliant on the honesty from departments that the defense team is stating that they are corrupt and are being charged of planting forensic evidence, right? So what Dr. LeBeau should have done, like I said at the beginning, subpoena the RAV and do all the forensic swabbing themselves. De novo, do double blind testing, no questions asked. Here, they left themselves wide open to criticism, which is completely crazy. For me, like it goes back to integrity again, because now remember, this is a couple layers here, but this is the guy who's come in to ensure the integrity of the process and has in himself in this process demonstrated his own lack of integrity. And so uh, that's where the poison fruit from the tree comes, right? Like, how can you correct believe it? Salt of someone's integrity when your integrity is being questioned here because you're making these leaps of assumptions, which is, as you just said, out of bounds of a scientific model. It's just, it's completely ridiculous. It, it honestly, it makes a mockery of the scientific principle. And isn't it rather ironical that it was Norm Garn who also backed in the admission of Ida Mephel, right? So he's meant to have scientific integrity Yet he knows that Ida Mephel was completely bogus. And I'm, I'm sure he also knew that the FBI results were dodgy as hell.
right? So you one, one has to really start questioning the integrity of the FBI and especially of Dr. LeBeau. That made no sense at all. Yes. Okay. Just wanted to know how far you were willing to go. The issue with this uh, procedure is not whether or not it's a valid result if you got if you are actually detecting EDTA. This is a good method. If the results end up that you detect EDTA and you identify EDTA, that's a good good indication that EDTA was present in that sample. The problem really occurs when EDTA is not detected in a blood stain. And the problem in that regard is from this method, I don't know whether that's simply because they didn't detect it or because it wasn't there. I can't tell the difference between those two for this method. I don't know really what their method detection limit is. So I don't know whether they didn't see it or it wasn't there. And looking at the, the data that is available in the stack, the validation tests that were done and those sorts of things, is there any indication that the, the FBI ever found out what the actual detection limit or method detection limit would be for this kind of a test? No, there's no such indication in these data. And so from this data, can you express any opinion about whether the three stains examined by Mr. LeBeau could have come from the blood sample, the blood tube Q49 that was also examined? It's quite possible that those blood swabs could have come from Mr. Avery's blood tube, but simply not been detectable by the laboratory. So even gone, having gone through this test, is it possible that EDTA is or was in those three RAV4 stains? Yes. What about the three swabs from the RAV that were not tested by Mr. LeBeau? Can any conclusion be drawn on that? I'm an analytical chemist. I'm not in the business of just guessing what's in samples. We have to test samples to decide what's in them. So can you hear what she just did? She just contradicted exactly what he said. You have to test them. You can't speculate what their results would be. Mic drop, fuck you, out she walks. Yeah. See, I, I, I never knew. I never knew that the FBI were into tarot card reading, right? It's ridiculous. Can you conclude then that any of the RAV4 stains that were examined by the FBI could not have come from the blood tube that contained Mr. Avery's blood? I can't conclude that. <laughs> um. I'm not sure whether the uh, people in chat will really understand what that means. Uh, essentially, um, when you have a detection system, uh, there's uh, upper and lower boundaries in a detection system. So what uh, that lady was talking about was uh, when you calibrate your machine, it only detects the EDTA when it reaches a specific concentration. Right? It's the way the test is set up. So if the EDTA uh, falls below a certain concentration, the machine can't detect it. It doesn't mean that the EDTA was not present. So therefore, their testing can't say um, there was no EDTA. What LeBeau should have said was, I couldn't detect the EDTA in the sample. It doesn't mean it wasn't there. So you have a lower and upper limit where you can detect a specific chemical. So it's not foolproof, right? And that's what that lady was saying. I think um, uh, Avizano, I think her name was. Um, so uh, Janine uh, Avizu. So she was basically saying, look, when you're running these type of tests, they're not 100% conclusive. If the EDTA is so low, it still may be present, but your testing cannot detect it. Clearly, you need another method to detect the EDTA. But here's the problem. Had Dr. LeBeau 
found EDTA, I'm telling you right now, the state would have said, yeah, but how do you know it wasn't there by contamination, right? How do you know it wasn't used in a car cleaning product or somehow that Teresa had contaminated that part of the dash or whatever, whatever, whatever with EDTA? And that is correct. So in other words, whether you found EDTA or you didn't, you can't draw any conclusion. And that is the weakness of that type of testing. It can go either way, positive or negative. The defense or the state would have argued it either way. Additionally, and maybe this is something we don't know the answer to, so I'm just going to pose the question if you can answer it. I'm kind of reading around the edges that it seems like EDTA may degrade over time. Well, that, that would be yes, less yes. identifiable. That's correct. Over time. And that's exactly what they couldn't test because the FBI has never tested blood that was that old, right? So, hence, EDTA has a shelf life. All chemicals over time break down, right? So they don't last forever. So, and it's not an all or none effect, right? So the EDTA over time could have broken down. But as Kelly showed, uh, once the coagulation factors themselves are no longer functioning, the blood is going to remain in a liquefied form. A lot of those coagulation factors are proteins, and proteins don't last forever. They denature and break down over time. So that EDTA testing is incredibly dodgy. And that's exactly why the FBI doesn't test for EDTA, because it's such an unreliable test. Uh, you know, I'm glad that you cleared that up, uh, Dr. Silkman. Because, you know, I was going to say earlier to a point that I was going to make and I was going to let it pass. And I felt that everyone in the courtroom kind of looked like lethargic at this point. And this was kind of like, I'm going to be honest, I was kind of look, I was kind of looking the other way. Like I was kind of like, oh, what is this now? Um, and and I think that that just says like this stuff is not this is not easy. The first pass to understand. And, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, but this is something that lawyers and the experts need to hammer like ringing a bell and just keep hammering this over and over because it's not the easiest to understand on the first pass through. And you might need it explained to you a couple times before it actually clicks. So if, thank you. Uh, oh, no. If you want to fall asleep, guaranteed to fall asleep, <laughs> read Dr. LeBeau's um, trial testimony. It is unbelievably complex, long, drawn out, and no joke. It took me a week to read it myself because it's full of scientific jargon. 99% of the audience would have fallen asleep and had no idea what the hell was going on because it's purely chemical, very, very complex. Which, you know, which puts it back on the attorneys to, you know, disseminate that information in a way that's digestible to the jury and, and then hammer it home. Right. And I think, you know, I don't know. I haven't seen actually the entire uh, courtroom. So I, all the all the footage from it. So I shouldn't say it for sure. But this seems like a point where, where you're like, this is really important re refuti, uh, rebuttal to that testimony. And like you guys were saying um, with the Jep, uh, the DEP trial is that uh, the experts, right? It was so important to get the experts. And here we are, the battle of the experts. And I think you mentioned it earlier. We all wish that there were more experts uh, throughout here. So that's just my take at this point. Correct. So, so my question for the panel is it seemed like the point that the uh, defense expert, whose name I already forgot, uh, <laughs> um, made was was a relatively simple one, uh, and th that and that was uh, just because you can't detect it doesn't mean that it wasn't there. It just means that your machine had some uh, some threshold. Uh, Correct. And the amount of and the amount fell. Well, why why do you suppose that Jerry Buting did not ask 
Dr. LeBeau about that on his cross-examination testimony. It, se it seems like a simple point. Well, he, he actually did, Big Jeff, but it didn't come across in MAM. You have to okay. read the actual trial testimony. Um, plus, you also have to read the documents supplied by the FBI. So I went through all of the documents, uh, and I don't have my presentation in front of me. Otherwise, I could actually tell you what the detection limit was. So anything underneath that level, you will not be able to detect. And the way to, to simply do it right is to get a container of water uh, and have, several, say, several containers of water and drop in a certain amount of sugar, right? And as you go down the containers, you're adding less and less sugar. Then you do a taste test and you ask the question, can I taste the sugar in this liquid? Yes or no? It'll come to a point where you've diluted the sugar so much that you can't taste it, even though there is sugar present, but it's in low concentration. So it's not an all or none event. It's what the machine can detect. That's what the issue is. And uh, Janine uh, Avizu said it beautifully, simply, and succinctly. Thank you. If we can convince them on the major points, then as long as there is a reasonable hypothesis, as the jury instruction says, then I think we've, we've got a chance to convince them. All this, of course, assumes that we end up with 12 people who really are unbiased and impartial, despite, you know, the months of publicity that they've had. And, and you know, it's asking a lot of this, human beings. This case, you know, could have been a futile exercise for the last month if we ended up with people that, that can't do that. And there's just no way of knowing. False imprisonment count here is the last vestige of the unsupported, inaccurate, uncorroborated claims of Brendan Dassey that were broadcast by agents of the state to everyone who had a TV turned on that threatened the right to a fair trial, that threatened the right to have a jury drawn from the venue in which this crime was charged and that curled the hair of anyone who listened to the description of a naked woman manacled to a bed, sexually assaulted, stabbed, throat cut, strangled when the slashing of her throat didn't kill her, and then only later a corpse shot 11 times. That was the story. That was the horror story that was presented. And the false imprisonment charge, as I say, is the last vestige of that horror story. It was a fable, an ugly, horrific fable, but a fable all the same belied by the physical evidence and by the testimony in the state's own case in chief. So I'm asking the court to, in a sense, ratify what the state has already done which is the abandonment of this charge and the abandonment of the theory that Brendan Dassey had anything to do with this or that the story that Brendan Dassey told under police questioning has any veracity, corroboration, or foothold in the evidence presented at this trial. During voir dire, number of and jurors indicated they were at least somewhat familiar with the case against Brenda Dassey. To submit this charge to the jury would, the court believes, invite the jury to fill in the blanks, if you will, by what they might otherwise remember about allegations that have not been supported by evidence in this case. The court concludes there is not sufficient evidence in the record to support a jury finding of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt on the false imprisonment charge 
and the court therefore grants the defendant's motion to dismiss that charge. Just before we continue on with this, I found my uh, presentation. The FBI did a um, working solution of EDTA, right? In other words, they make up a solution of EDTA and they use it in their testing. And I've got their document right here. Now, you wait till you listen to this. They made up a, a standard solution of EDTA and they said in their report, stable for at least six months, right? Hear that, stable for at least six months. And these guys were testing EDTA from a blood vial that was 11 years old when they tested it. So their own laboratory um, report said that the solution that they made up for testing was only meant to be stable for a period of six months. They then tested blood and they said stable for at least two years. So how on earth are they deriving any form of conclusion of blood that was 11 years old? Their own documentation showed that they should have never tested that blood because of the inaccuracies, potential inaccuracies in their results, right? So that clearly the judge should have just thrown out all of those results in concluding that what the FBI tried to do was not fit for purpose. That blood was too old. You had no idea what it was going to give. Where, where did they get this six-month-old uh, EDTA? <laughs> blood. Uh, <laughs> they just started, no, they didn't no, have no. enough time, right? No, what, what they did is they made up a solution of EDTA to test their machine, Right. And they said that it's a stable for at least six months. Oh, would have been said, would have, if yeah, they did it six months yeah. later. Okay. That's right. So in other words, they won't trust their own solution of EDTA. They would make a brand new one because they can't guarantee results after six months. Right? And hence, what the hell are the FBI testing blood that's 11 years old from that blood vault? It makes no sense. And what's the date of that 300-page report? Did they really crank out 300 pages in, in like a couple of weeks? That's impressive. I'll, I'll have to get you the original documents. <laughs> They're all, all um, on stephenavery.org. I think we've got them on the Foul Play website as well. Um, the FBI submitted a ton of documents uh, talking about what things have EDTA in them, the EDTA uh, experimental controls that they used, and they wrote a really large report looking at all of their results. I went through the whole lot. There's a huge amount of stuff to go through. A good sign that you're trying to bullshit somebody is when you submit a massive report with a ton of uh, exhibits uh, in a short amount of time. I think the saying is, if you can't, baff um, if you can't dazzle them with brilliance, baffle them with bullshit that's, that's, right. exactly, that's exactly what the fbi did all right well we only got a couple of minutes left on the actual video of this episode but uh kelly has uh offered up to do another experiment so if you guys are up for it let's do that kelly hell yeah let's go so um what I might do in a minute is I'm going to clean this out because what I'm going to do is I want to show you that I want to show it when it's clean because I want to show you an experiment. But for now, I just want to show you if it's whether it's dry or not. As you can see, oh, hang on, I'm not even touching it. It's um, it's still tacky. So now it's tacky as it, it's wet but tacky. It's gone almost a little bit jelly. As you can see, I'm scraping it. Um, the reason why I wanted to show you is that because what I want to do with it next is quite interesting. But remember, this is EDTA blood. So it's still wet, still a bit tacky. Then what I want to do is I wanted to go back to this um, drip itself. And what I want to do is I'm going to, um, I'm going to take a photo of it on my phone. Hang on a minute. When I, I'm not sure if I've taken it yet. Okay, and then what I wanted to do is watch this. Um, 
I'm using my, it's hard because I'm using, so I already had that prepared. So I wanted to do a comparison because it's been, a lot of people have considered that um, it may be the fact that they did the planting early within a few hours before anyone even got there in the morning of the 6th. As you guys see, you saw it all live. No editing. That's what the result was. So you guys compare what we see with a few hours or not even a few hours, a few, well, an hour at max sitting there based to what we see in the picture. Um, what I then wanted to also do was show you this trick. So I'm going to clean. I've got some just normal water here. So, Ke so you, Kelly, before 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 you go on, I'm trying to understand some of the implications of the test that you, that you're uh, that you're showing us. Mm -hmm. Are you saying ha had that not been um, EDTA blood, that the amount of time that it took for the blood to drip from that spot that it was all the way down was facilitated by EDTA, and that's why we had a long stripe there? Is, is that is that part of your conclusion? Or yeah, so am I gravity overthinking it? No, no, no. So gravity itself, it's funny because when I first did this experiment, I couldn't work out how they had such a small drip. I could, I could, every time I tried to recreate it, I was like, how the fuck did they beat gravity? And I couldn't work out why because fresh blood is actually more runnier than this, funny enough. Well, not really. They've both got the same consistencies, but it's just the way it just falls is just it kind of rolls different have you noticed that there's no if you you guys can't see because it's such a it's on a computer but there is no signs of coagulation in it although it's um it's as you can see it's dry it's until i get down to the bottom and then you see that little clot formed which is your little coagulation and you can see it's still i'm able to draw blood from it so when i first did the experiments i was like how because you gotta remember when the, when you look at their picture there's i've got to get the measurements i think it's only like nine millimeters in length down um and then i was thinking how do they how do they manage to get that i think it comes down to basically it, it comes down to the um it comes down to mass because it comes down to the the level of um, you know gravity and how you've got the um, angle of the my experiment, which I did use a ruler and I had all that keyed in. And um, what I'm showing you is essentially a, what an hour, and that's a, that's basically what my experiment was to see what the blood of fresh versus EDTA would have looked like. Um, again, I'm showing you backwards. So then what I, oh, I don't know what I just did with my little dropper. So what I wanted to do was I basically want to get a bit of water and I just want to, oh, hang on. I want to show you back here. So this is, I've just dropped a little bit of water on it. I'm just going to swirl it up because you got to remember this is, um, this has now gone a little bit coagulated. Now I've done this with fresh blood as well. Fresh blood, you can't do that. Once it's coagulated, as Dr. Silkman will probably tell you afterwards, it goes, it breaks away. It doesn't dissolve. It, it just runs into like a pink nothingness. So this is EDTA blood. And all I've done here is I've added normal water. Usually you would use sterling, like sterling water. Um, and it, pardon? Do you still? Do I, wow. Yeah, Field or deionized water. Yeah, but wow. because I don't have it on me, I'm just going to use this one. Now watch this. Do a little shake. Back to blood. I'm able to plant again. Correct. And you know why? Because Amazing. there's no there's no coagulation factors there. Right? Where in fresh blood there is. You can't do this yes, with fresh correct. blood. In fresh yes. blood, it'll it'll congeal. Right, it'll congeal yep. up because when you form a clot, there are two stages. There's a soft clot, and then there's uh, extensive cross-linking uh, by I think it's uh, collagen, fibrin. There's a whole lot of uh, clotting factors that come into, uh, and also the involvement of of um, uh, uh, platelets as well. So it's a complex process 
Once it congeals, you're not going to be able to reverse it. But in blood that's got EDTA, there are no clotting factors that are active, which means you can reconstitute the blood. Correct. So that, that's a um, actually a very uh, important point. I, I know I know people who have suggested that one source of Stephen Avery's blood that may have been available to uh, the murderer, if the murder plan of the blood would have been the Grand Am, and that blood could have been reconstituted from that from those stains. And what I'm no, hearing can't is do it. No, 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 no chance. No, can't okay. do no. it. You cannot do it. You cannot very do good. it with fresh blood. You can do it with EDTA, as you guys just witnessed live. You watched <laughs> me do it with normal water. Because there was, all, and you guys saw it. It was tacky. It was it was already in the hardcore coagulated. It was starting that stage, and I was still able to. And now here's this stain here. This is dry. This bit's dry. Well, I'm sorry that I just added a little bit of that tip. So let's try it to this one as well. Just a bit of water. Okay, this one's more was more drier than the other one. This one didn't really have the tackiness. It was just basically dry. Okay. Let me draw it up. It's now been liquefied again. It's been liquefied again. Look. So, <laughs> so what? What? Wow. What you? What we're trying to? What you're trying to conclude from this is is the following. Had someone got access to that RAV really early on, all they had to do was get a dropper and see if they re could reconstitute the drop of blood that was on the back door frame, correct? If that came back up into solution, then you know it was from a purple top tube, correct? Wow. Wow. <laughs> so if you that were able to sounds like a simple... <laughs> yeah, you were I'm able gonna to show you something more. <laughs> if Haven't you were to re liquefy it, sorry, Kelly. No, no, it, keep going. I was gonna if, say, I was sorry. gonna ask you, even even after uh, this amount of time, that would say, I mean, if she left that well, there for another 10 years, so that's the, our that's the problem now, big Jeff, is that the blood will be desiccated, it'll all the sorry. liquid will be completely out. Um, uh, what Kelly was able to do was uh, re. Uh, constitute the blood that's been sitting there for about an hour but what i'm saying is is that no wonder the state didn't want to give the RAV4 away because all they had to do is get a dropper and see if they could reconstitute that blood and that'll give the game away right then and there so the opportunity for that has been lost but but i would then, say yeah yeah okay i would, I would say correct Wow, for such a simple test, and we had to have Dr. LeBeau go through, uh, you know, PhD in chemistry. Uh, That's right. That, uh, That's exactly right. Okay, and the last thing I wanted to show you is I wanted to put this at rest once and for all because I don't know how many times I've had people come and say, "Oh, it was a Q-tip that did the planting." They, so Bobby, used a Q-tip, and I keep saying to them, "You understand." a q-tip right honestly this is how i want you to understand something a q-tip has like a cotton fabric as you guys can see what do you think its purpose is to get it's wax absorbed. out of your ears oh. yeah well actually you're not meant to even put it in your ears big chest. it's absorbent it's absorbent but it absorbs it's an absorbent so when Correct. people think when people just assume because of the pattern on the ignition that this was used to put you know as the actual, I don't know, the pattern per se, the applicator. I'm going to show you why that doesn't make sense. So as you can see, I'm going to put the, my uh, into the Q-tip right into the blood. I'm going to really try to soak it up. As you can see, and then I'm going to put it on. Look. It absorbs. You can't use a Q-tip. It's not coming to make off. Mark. It's not because it absorbs it. You the app, right? <laughs> You're seeing it right now, everyone. The Q-tip was not the applicator or method to plant the blood. Now I put on gloves for a reason, because the next thing is people say, "Oh, they squeezed it out." 
as you can see, I'm squeezing as fucking hard as I can here. You saw me put it in the in the liquid and nothing. Look, not even my fingers have got blood on it. That's why they use those cotton applicators uh, at crime scenes in order to absorb a sample onto the Q-tip, not to add a sample onto another surface. But couldn't, couldn't you put it in there so much that it was so saturated that there was a drop of blood at the end of it that you could draw? With? Well, let's try. Oh, hang on. Oh, sorry, I keep, I'm trying to look at make sure I'm getting to the bottom of it. No, it's not even, oh, that's got it now. Sorry. Maybe that bit. But you know what I've done? Shape. More of a seagull shape. But here's the problem, though, <laughs> Big Jeff. Turn your look. wrist. Turn your as, wrist. As you, here's, here's the problem. I Here's the problem with that, though. This is now completely saturated, and it has absorbed a, a lot of my blood left. Right. So you just that not would have an had efficient to be, way to do it. It would be a dumb which way is not to an do efficient, it. A very yeah. dumb, because if you absorb too much of that ADTA, and you have no you're taking all the blood and you're ending you're up leaving it on the end of the Q-tip. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense, Kelly. Thank you. But what I think you told me is that maybe what it looks like a Q-tip because that's how they used it to take a sample. Because that's yes. what they used to pull the sample, which is exactly what you're saying. This is used hmm. for to taking samples, not giving samples. Not so at, that's right. See not that exactly. Part, when you Not see that point. mark, it, it might actually be a Q-tip taking the sample from the person who used a Q-tip to extract the sample. Well, we, we have no situ photos. Yeah, we, we know that Groffy and Colhane uh, use Q-tips to do presumptive tests and DNA tests. So that means that the, the blood that you see on the ignition switch was actually swabbed three times, once by Groffy and twice by Colhane, which means that they used the Q-tip to take a sample of blood to test for um, the presence of blood. So they diluted the sample out. So there you go. I've just done it. I took a Q-tip. Yeah. I know I didn't use saline. I used just honestly water because I didn't have any left. And, look, I was able to create my own pattern by removing the blood versus putting it there. So. Correct. That's what we see in the RAV in terms of the ignition. That is, we don't see any in situ pictures, period. So um, we're only taking, we, we don't really know the true pattern of what it was like when it was first no. put in there. We're only that's seeing the aftermath. And yes. that's what you see here. I've just created a pattern of my own. Um, so that's kind of wanted to show you guys. Now, I just wanted to let you know that I'm in a bathroom. And I have special venting in here, which I can um, control. And so when I did my experiments today, you got to remember, it is, it's going into winter here. It is a very cold, rainy day. But when I did my experiments, I want you to know that that was a factor I took into a big consideration. This bathroom was off limits for a week because I had it under temperature control for all the experiments. So I just wanted to let you know that because when I did my experiments today, I didn't I didn't factor that in um, in terms of because um, temperature can change uh, the time duration of blood as well. Um, I just wanted to disclose that. And <laughs> this is nothing, but have a look at my bathroom now. It's like a blood bath. It's a crime scene. <laughs> it's a crime scene. You should have seen it, honestly, when I was doing my experience experiments it was insane I've got a picture of the aftermath it was because I kept the door closed at all time and no one could come in I remember I had to come in once because it was relatively warm outside and I was worried that the temperature was getting a little bit um, warmer in here even though I had the air con on pumping in here so I, I was it was freezing but there is actually videos of me coming in with ice packs and putting it on my surfaces just to with a thermometer just to check to make sure that I had all the surfaces cooler than what they should have been. 
Um, another thing that I want to remind you guys, I did, I did my experiments right here on white. Color does make a difference as well. Uh, that's another factor that you have to consider when we you do experiments um, because if you were dropping red, dark blood on black, like I, I was doing in my car, it was turning white. So that's why I had to improvise and that's when I went to get the um, alternative material that I started using. And also the biggest other thing that I found is lighting itself. Um, the bathroom's good because it has a good bright light. I keep the window open. I was able to use natural light plus um, other lights. But these are all the factors that you have to consider when you do these experiments. So although I just did a real simplified one today, you have to understand my real experiments were really, really thought thorough and really thought through. It was three consultants, ED consultants and myself that put a plan together um, how I was going to do it. And yeah, it was, it's a big breakdown, but it was really, really constructive to the point that I was really, really happy with um, obviously the outcome. And I, again, I, I can't wait to show more, but you got to remember, I've got over 300 files of audio, like videos and pictures, and it's a lot to siphon through to find the relevant stuff to show the impact of EDTA blood versus fresh blood. Um, and there is a significant difference. Um, and I, I believe I was able to capture that. Now, does that mean that I have debunked anyone's theories? No, that, that's the saddest thing about this entire experiment. You still walk away not knowing. You can get a better understanding of blood in terms of coagulation and all the variables that come with it, but it doesn't prove what actually happened. So I just want to disclose that as well because I'm not, when I do these experiments, I'm not trying to force people to think that it's EDTA blood. I'm not trying to force people to be like, no way was that EDTA blood, it was fresh. I'm not trying to debunk that either. I'm just trying to get us all to understand together and learn together um, because there is a lot of myths. Until you actually do it, you don't realize that things are harder than it seems. You can't just pick up blood. You just can't, especially fresh. Silkman has said it. it the coagulation, it just changes. Everything changes. So um, thanks for allowing me to do that today, guys. I'm sorry if it interrupted the flow of the podcast, but I just thought that we are moving into another bit of a blood and I saw an opportunity and I really wanted to use it today. I think we've all been uh, kind of waiting for that and the drip, drip, drip of the blood uh, did not hurt the flow of the podcast. So I wouldn't worry about that. If anything, I commend you and thank you for taking the time and, and clearing that up for us. As usual, more questions than answers. Um, that was brilliant. And I can tell you that I've thought for years, uh, as, as soon as I saw that picture of the, of the, um, the, the blood near the ignition uh, and the, sh and the shape of it, it looks very much to me like it was caused by a, a Q-tip. And when when I saw how uh, what what you just did, how the Q-tip, um, you know, sort of created a, sort of a, a negative spot, if you will, right? It 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 wiped up the blood that was there. I'm I'm baffled as to how the shape of of that um, you know that stain, where where is where is it from, and is it is it any proof, um, you know that. Uh, was was it was it reconstituted blood? Is the only way to get blood in that shape, uh, you know, sort of reconstituting it, uh, you know, with the uh, you know with, with the fluid that they might have used to sort of activate it and swab it? The fact that it still left a mark like that, um, or, or is that the mark that you know if, if Stephen Avery is indeed guilty and that is indeed his blood? How, how do you get a mark like that? I, I, um, I think um, I, I think I can answer that. What, what Kelly showed was a very simple and very elegant. And the way you can conclude what Kelly showed was that um, if you use fresh blood or you use blood from a purple top tube, um, if you apply it to a surface, it's going to behave the same, right? The only difference is this. With blood from a purple top tube, it's not going to coagulate because the coagulation factors are gone. The EDTA prevents coagulation, which means that if you're quick enough, you can reconstitute the blood from a purple top tube and make it 
liquid again. If the fresh blood coagulates, you're not going to be able to reconstitute it because clotting has taken place. The blood is going to congeal. Now, Here's the difference, and I think this is the way you can sum up with what Kelly has demonstrated. If you're using fresh blood to plant, you've got a minimum amount of time to do it, correct? So you've got to do it really quick. And this was the problem with Kathleen Zellner's blood from a sink. And we'll go over that when we do season two, right? So if you're going to plant blood from a sink, you've got to do it really fast. If you have blood from a purple top tube, you've got time. That's the difference. And Kelly elegantly showed that her blood that's been sitting in that purple top tube for nearly two years is still in liquefied form. That blood vial from 1996, when the FBI examined it, was still in liquefied form. So that means you've got time. You don't have to panic. You can take a sample of that blood, put it in an Eppendorf tube, and you can keep it with you for months, and it's still in liquefied form. So fresh blood, you've got to use it quick. Blood that's in a purple top, you've got time. And the final point is this. Kelly alluded to the fact that we have no in situ photographs of those blood spots. The spots that you see, the photos that you see on the ignition, they have already been swabbed with swabs. So in other words, you don't have an in situ picture showing how that blood stain looked like before Groffy put a swab to it, before Colhane put two swabs to it. So every time you put fluid on a swab and you take a sample of blood, you're going to dilute the blood. And hence why you get that dovetail appearance that goes to prove that the blood swab on the ignition switch was swabbed with a solution designed to take blood away and test it. So in other words, Jeff, Big Jeff, what you've got is not an in situ picture, but a picture after it has already been swabbed. Hence, you get that dovetail appearance of the blood. So here is our picture that I we all did together because we were all live. I've just sent it to Jeff Jones. Um, there it is. And that, and that picture from the RAV is inside of the passenger door. Is that where that, that is? is? That is the drop from the passenger door. Yeah. Correct. And that's, um, that's a solid drop of blood. And Kelly showed mm -hmm. one drop of blood was all it took to give that streak. One drop. What we see here is, you guys saw it all live. So you can see after an hour or whatever, however long it was, this is what we see. Now, I documented um, fresh blood versus uh, EDTA blood for the first five-minute cycle of it dropping. Every minute on the dot, I took a photo. I took a photo with the flash on versus the flash with the flash off. I wanted to document that because you have to, like Silkman says, with fresh blood, you have to work fast. Um, the smaller the drop, the quicker it turns. Um, so I really wanted to capture that first five minutes and I thought it was only fair that I gave EDTA the five minute rule as well because you want to see the comparison. Um, and then what I did was I did, <clears throat> excuse me, I did day one day two, day three, day four, day five, and day six. Um, because if the blood was honestly sitting in the car, allegedly the night um, the Ken Kratz claims that he bled in it because he, he killed Teresa, um, you'd expect to see, you'd, I wanted to capture what that blood would look like and the duration and, and, and see how it would... Um, what's that word uh not decay but decompose in terms of um when when the blood essentially dries out coagulates flakes. discolor I wanted, yeah discolor i wanted to capture it all i wanted everyone to be able to view it when i did my experiments i used um a syringe on one side and a dripper on a, the same 
method I used today, like a dropper dripper on the other side, because I wanted to see, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to try to capture what method. I, as you guys can see, I already tried this Q-tip before. I knew this Q-tip wouldn't work because I have already done this experiment. Um, and I try to recreate every possible thing that's always been in the community. Was it done by a Q-tip? Was it done by a dropper? Was it done by a syringe? Um, you know, all these, all these alternatives. So I did it all. Everything I could have, I've heard out there. I did a lot of research into all the possible scenarios and I try to recreate every single one because I wanted it to bring it it's not a matter of debunking it but it was a matter of trying to understand it is what I'm trying to say in before and that's what I wanted to essentially capture is the time frame because I can tell you guys this right now and this is almost like a bit of a um a little bit of a cheeky behind the curtain thing what you see now in day one versus day six is this six very, very significantly different. And I think that's part of the entire problem we have with this case is when Groffy gets to it, it's essentially have been meant to have been sitting there since the 31st untouched, yet that blood drip we see here doesn't look like six day old fresh blood to me so in other, I... word, in other words it's fresher right the mm. application of it mm. it's uh very different and, and and this is why when we go back and we look at the blood in the back of where Teresa laid the the original pictures that does look authentic because it has turned into a the color you're meant to see which you will see in my experiments after that few days duration it's it's like a a rusty brown color it's not bright red like this this has got that freshness to it you kind of go huh that looks like it was just dropped basically and like you could almost say it's still a little bit tacky and isn't that isn't that interesting? Sorry, Kelly. That no, the go FBI, for it. That the FBI, as a positive control, didn't test Teresa Horbach's blood in the back of the RAV. Mm. There was your perfect opportunity because Cohen did the swabbing, and that would have been a beautiful internal control of blood with no EDTA or a blood from the from the Pontiac Grand Dam as a control. What I always found interesting was when you go back and you listen to Kathleen um, talk about this situation, she always says, I came into this expecting to provide proof that it came from the EDTA vial. I, I, I believe that's it. I knew that's how they did it. She believed that. I think she even believed that's how they did it. She then said, I was then told very quickly that I wasn't able to bring any scientific proof of that. Once I realized that, I had to let it go. Now, to me, I often wonder whether her going towards the bathroom sink um, alternative was because she had no other option. She had to let the, the vial go because it had, one, been done, and two, there was nothing to that like what's there's nothing else she could provide or bring forward with it that was not already out there um does that then mean that she does consider that it might be still from the vial yeah to me it means that she just had no other option but to let it go so what if the blood theory isn't something she really even believes either it's just that she has to then move on to something else and the reason why i'm I, I get her blood theory um, argument. I do. It, it, you can tie it to a Denny, which is excellent. But here's the thing. When I was doing these experiments, I was balanced as hell. I wasn't. I never pushed these experiments to give me a conclusion. I did them. And if it, was, if it would have worked out one way, it would have just worked out that way. I didn't influence it in any way because I was trying to understand myself. That's what people say to me. Oh, were you bummed when you worked out this or that? And I'm like, no, 
it just helped me understand it. If it would have worked out that, you know, I thought it came from the sink, I would have said, yeah, guys, definitely from the sink. But it didn't. Um, and, and that's the thing that I think in terms of this, these experiments, it's really, there's so many factors to it. And when I look back now, when I play devil's advocate against my own experiments, you've got to remember this, guys. If I can see the problems in it, in Kathleen's sink theory, the state will use them too. I'm not saying anything that won't be put against her in terms of an expert later on if it ever went to trial and the sink theory was part of it. And that's basically just part of the the journey that I took with these experiments is just working it all out. The uh, Yeah, I agree with you, Kelly. The sink theory will only work if the uh, planter had access to the blood and the RAV4 quickly, right? Yeah. So that's a super high-risk strategy to take. If you use blood from a purple top tube, you have time. You do. That's the difference. You have time. Well, it's not just – it's not just – this is when I was doing um, my – so when I did all my experiments, I went back and I wrote up – I wrote myself a report. I even did better than Andy Colburn. I wrote myself a report <laughs> of, like, what I – my journey and what I thought about it and what I was doing and how I conducted it and blah, blah, blah. And I basically thought that when she gave us the blood in the sink argument, I got it in terms of a Denny connection. I really did. But then when I looked at it, I was like, but there's so many problems. Not only is it a time a factor, you then have to provide proof that someone even knew he bled in the sink. They might have known that, he, okay, let's say theoretically someone did know he cut his finger open that night but that's really specific that someone knew that he actually went into his trailer just to bleed into the sink that's that's another element that is just really big and it's the most crucial because if you didn't know he was bleeding you wouldn't go into the trailer to begin with and if he did go into the trailer who says he even bled anywhere he could have went in there just to get a tissue and had left no spot so and then it's then i thought Okay, then you have the time, like Dr. Silkman said, you've got to pick up the blood, take it to where the RAV is and drop it without the coagulating clotting factor becoming a part of the, the problem. But then I thought to myself, but you've got to back that up. You've got another stage before you even get to that. And that stage is the method. How are you going to take the blood? We now know it's impossible to do it with a Q-tip. So unless um, Stephen had an eyedropper there or a syringe on standby, how else was he going to pick it up? How could yeah. anyone pick it up if they're not planned? This would have to be a very planned in basic physics because it's these little things in between you have to factor in. And then you have temperature. And then you have – and the biggest thing when I got to the end of my document, my apology, my report, I wrote and I wrote in big and I circled it was um, – you're going back to her RAV. You're going into her RAV. You are potentially incriminating and contaminating the RAV again yourself by putting yourself there. Um, when me and Kath did some, uh, uh, we went back and looked at statistics, it starts from 40% to 80% in terms of um, contamination. When people it's go too back risky. to a, Yeah, it's too risky. So it starts it's at 40%. Way too risky way too risky so if you're going back to a rav to plant someone in it you are not guaranteeing that you're not planting yourself at the exact same time that's huge and it's not just that if this car this rav was allegedly at the turnaround you are then potentially being at risk of being seen at the rav if someone drove past there are all these factors that make for me my personal opinion the blood in the sink theory It's not plausible. It's not plausible. Correct. And uh, the other thing, of course, is that all the experimental results could have been controlled by one person, and that's Sheree Cohane. It's just a shell game. Everything could have been controlled in the laboratory. That's right. Well, thank you, uh, Kelly, for that uh, side uh sidebar there and taking us down that track because that stuff is super interesting it looks like uh jeff was interested dr so i hope you guys at home were uh interested because it was a 
extremely fascinating and interactive to to see that stuff done like right right before our own eyes. So again, I really appreciate that Kelly for uh, taking the time to do it. But with that said, we really need to get back to the video. So let's wrap up the last about five minutes and then we'll have our uh, closing comments for today. I'm in charge and the court therefore grants the defendant's motion to dismiss that charge. With your motion hearings this morning on a litany of issues that have already gone before the jury, how do you unring that bell with the jury? In one way, we're back to February 28, 2006. We're back to the three counts Steve faced originally. And in another way, we can never be back to February 28, 2006, uh, because March 1 and March 2, 2006, happened uh, with the state's press conferences and all of the ugly and, as it turns out, untrue things that were said publicly against our client since then. So is it nice to see the last vestige of those allegations fall away? Sure. And am I gloating over it? No, because they never should have been there in the first place. Would Stephen Avery have been out on bail had it not been for those, uh, had it not been for that March press conference? You could ask yourself that question. Right, because the property bonds. The reason for the March press conference uh, was was to uh, get those tra charges added. The addition of those charges it had the bail up by fifty percent from from five hundred thousand to seven hundred fifty thousand, uh, and uh, therefore the the property bond was didn't have enough money to cover, and so and, and it was therefore and, and denied. So yep. it had, it's had its effect. The state didn't need that charge anymore. They got what they wanted out of it, which was keeping Stephen Avery in prison. That's 100% correct. They, it, they used it for a purpose, and then they dropped those three charges while in court. It was truly disgusting. Uh, you can move the microphone over to Mr. Avery then. Uh, Mr. Avery, do you understand that the decision uh, whether to testify or not is yours to make? Yes. That means uh, you can listen to your attorneys and, and listen to their advice, but ultimately it's your call. Do you understand that? Yes, I do. Has anyone uh, made any threats or promises to you to influence your decision? No, they didn't. Have you uh, thoroughly discussed your decision uh, with your attorneys? Yes, I did. And have you made a decision as to whether or not you wish to testify in this case? Yes. What is your decision? The decision is I'm an innocent man, and I, there's no reason for me to testify. That everybody knows I'm innocent. Okay. So you wish not to testify, is that correct? Yes. It's an important point to, to discuss about this decision, uh, not maybe necessarily to second guess Stephen Avery, but um, I guess for me, it seems that uh, Stephen Avery is not someone who is going to be very successful in a cross examination. And I think that was probably the counsel he was given. Stephen, uh, I agree. Stephen would have been taken apart. He's not the type of guy that uh, has got a good grip on the chronology of events, right? Whereas you could imagine um, being cross-examined by Kratz, Fallon and Garn, who've got everything written down on a piece of paper to the, you know, to the actual minute. And Stephen Avery had already given uh, interviews before uh, where he got events mixed up, days mixed up. It would have really looked very, very bad for him, uh, especially if he contradicted himself. But mm -hmm. I just want to highlight one important point. Have a look at Stephen. The guy absolutely is traumatized. He, he is, I don't know, I mean, remember, he already been sitting in prison for more than a year. He looks like a terribly beaten man. 
he just cannot believe it's happened to him again. Mm. Going on to this discussion, and I know this is going to be cheeky, but if I see an opportunity, I take it. Um, we see it in terms of the Amber Heard taking the stand and how she was absolutely destroyed because they used her own words against her. And I think this is a very smart move for Stephen to have made this decision not to because like Dr. Silkman said, they had the times, they had all the information in front of them and they would have talked him around in circles to confuse him so much. It probably would have looked um, bad for him because it would have maybe came across more like he was hiding something or deflecting or something on those terms versus he just didn't remember and he was just getting confused. So I think that's, um, I think in most cases they don't take the stand when you, I just finished watching Lincoln Lawyer uh, as a new Netflix series. Absolutely loved it. I highly suggest you guys give it a try. Um, although it is fictional, obviously, but it is really clever how they did it because they bought in the true um, American system and how you pick jurors and, and what things mean. And it's very clever how they really um, brought it all in. And you see them get to that point where I'm not going to say too much for the people that are going to watch it already have, but I will say that there is a part where the defendant wants to take the stand and the Lincoln lawyer is like, dude, you never do that. We just never do that. That's not something you should ever do in any criminal case. Um, they will twist things to you and it, it, it comes down to your demeanor. If the jurors just don't, you could be winning, but then you take the stand and they just don't like you because of the way you look, you've lost. And I think that speaks volumes with Amber. The moment she opened her mouth, everything, all her credibility went out the window. If they had kept it to a very simplified, um, you know, task of, giving their evidence and she didn't speak to the volume she did, she might have had a shot. But, I again, I think this is a very good decision for Steve. Yeah, I, I agree, Kelly. If, if, I, if I were Ken Kratz, um, in between the sexting of domestic abuse victims, which he was probably doing during trial, um, I, I think that uh, I, I would have tried to, uh, you know, irritate Stephen and got him mad and, and, and see if I could sort of, make him angry. And I, and I think that's probably something that you could have pulled off. And I think that would have played extremely negatively uh, with the jury. And I think it would have been pretty easy to do given the obvious state of traumatization that he was in. So I think it was a and very I, wise decision. Yeah. And I think Ken Kratz is such a dirty dog that I think he would take cheap shots. I think that if he saw opportunities, he would have taken them. And even though he knew that they would have probably been objected to, he still would have done it to plant seeds. He would have asked questions that he knows he won't, shouldn't ask. But when you watch the Amber trial and you watch the Lincoln Lawyer um, series, they kind of portray this. And that is sometimes it's not about their answers. It's the questions. If you can get the jurors to hear your question, they allow, and even though they know they're going to get it object, objected to, that's part of the strategy because then the jurors hear the question and they answer it in their own head. And that's part of the strategicness. And I think Ken would have used that a lot against Stephen, tripped him up, walked him around in circles, and then said things that weren't probably true, got Stephen all flustered, like, what are you talking about? And then like just driven the knife into him. An already frustrated man. Agree, Big Jeff. I think um, I agree with the panel. Um, Stephen Avery was a very, very easy target because of who he was and his background. Now, let's think about this, right? If Stephen Avery was truly innocent and had nothing to do with the murder of Teresa Horbart, think about it. This was five minutes of his life. Five minutes. That is, he saw Teresa Horbach come in, take photographs, he paid, she left. That is all he knows. That is all he knows. He knows nothing else, right? If he's truly innocent, he never did a thing, right? The mere fact that um, the estate dropped those three charges 
uh, effectively neutralized Brendan Dassey, right? So they were very, very clever. I agree with Big Jeff. They introduced those additional charges. They raised the bail. They couldn't meet bail. Stephen Avery remained in prison. Then they dropped the charges because they couldn't call Brendan Dassey, right? The state could not call him Brendan Dassey. And we've gone over this uh, in our Reading with Uncle Ken series that, we've done, that we're doing in foul play. And I agree with Kelly. Make no mistake, the biggest, dirtiest dog, the most dangerous person in that courtroom was Ken Kratz. He knew how to run it. He knew how to run that show. He knew how to manipulate the judge and the jury. Had Stephen taken the stand, Ken Kratz would have ripped them apart and it would have looked really bad. So I want people on the panel and chat to think, if Stephen was innocent, this represented five minutes of his life. And look what happened. He's now spending the rest of his life in prison for five minutes of nothing. A photographer coming onto the property, taking a picture, him paying her and she leaving. That's all he knows. That's all he knows if he's truly innocent. It's, it blows your mind when you think about it. I think from my own perspective that if I was in a similar position, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty, I'm an accomplished orator. You know, I've been paid to speak. I have, I feel comfortable in front of an audience, in front of a group, getting my facts out in a mostly effective way. I try to. Um, and I don't think I would take the stand in my own trial because I would be too worried that that one time that you make a slip up, you say the wrong thing. That's not the word I meant to say. Or the one time they ask you questions and your reaction, it's not even what you say. It's just your physical reaction makes the jury think that. It, and so, uh, yeah, I think it's absolutely the right call. I concur with, 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 every, with everything you guys said. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. <laughs> so Steve Avery talk today. What was that like? From what I've seen of him before, he he likes to talk. So I I, I think he probably would have liked to be up on the stand, but um, it was kind of counterintuitive. Uh, if he's innocent, he should go up on the stand and say, you know, he has nothing to hide. So why you know, why isn't he up there? But um, Mike, what was going through your mind when he said he was an innocent man? Um, I just want to say this, and, and they're the ones that call Stephen the simple guy. This is not a very complex, you know, it's just a really simple answer from, from uh, Mr. Halbach here. And uh, just, why is he digging in on Stephen like this? I, I, well, I, is, it a full, is it a full court press from the family, too, that... That they're just it, it's it seems uh, it seems baffling to me. Anyway, go ahead. Well, do you have comments? Well, I do have two two comments. One is what well, why does Mike Hallbach feel that it's even appropriate for the family to offer a comment at this time, right? Uh, I mean, there's just there's just some people uh, who never met a camera they didn't like, and and Mike seems to be one of those people. I don't. I don't think it was appropriate at all um, for the family to make a, a comment at this time. Number one, and number two, maybe somebody in the press should have asked them whether the mourning process was over yet. Um, yeah. Look, I agree. I I did not understand Mike Hallbach's motivation um, for even even responding like that. I mean, you know. Imagine if it was another family member being judged by a judge and a jury, you know, how, how would he like that? So he, he can't put himself in Stephen Avery's shoes, right? No one can. Look what happened to him in 1985, right? That's enough to break any human being. If Stephen Avery is truly innocent, imagine just the mental anguish of having gone through that 
twice, right? Knowing that you haven't done a damn thing. And I, to me, this left a sour taste in my mouth. My call bark having a smirk on his face. Hey, leave it up to the judge. Leave it up to the jury. You're there to listen into the proceedings. You know, don't make smart ass comments like that. It doesn't look good. Just an opinion, of course. Well said. Same thing that's been going through my mind for 16 months. Uh, everything I've heard him say hasn't been the truth. Uh, no different today. You know, I think that he thinks he's been let out of prison once. He thinks it's probably going to happen again. But um, I don't think uh, I don't think so. <laughs> All right, so that's it. That's the evidence. Now what? Well, now we argue it. And, uh, you know, you guys will have the day off tomorrow. By and large, yeah. Let's talk about a couple of things. You guys started with six counts against Steve. We're down to three counts. That's the good news. The bad news is if we lose count one, nothing else matters. No. Nothing else matters. If we lose count one, he's going to prison for the rest of his life. Bar barring winning on appeal or, you know, testing of the EDTA later, but the sentence will be life in prison if we lose count one. Well, the first thing that I wanted to say is that, I, I mean, I applaud Dean uh, right here for just being straight up with, you know, with the Avery's that, you know, it's hard to say that. It's like a doctor delivering the bad news. You know, nobody wants to be the one to have to say that your son, there's a chance that he's going to be in prison for the rest of his life. And we all think that he's innocent. Like, so that's one of the hardest things I think a lawyer or a doctor or anybody in a position that would have to deliver information like that. And I think he did it as best as anyone could. Um, comments or should we roll right into, yeah, Kelly? I was just going to say, I think, I think I just for the first time really understood what Dean was trying to say there. He was, um, and the reason why I say that is because there's always been the jury talk. Like, we know that their their first count, there were seven innocent, two undecided, I think, and two guilty. Um, or maybe my maths was just really fucked up then. Hang on, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Yep, yeah, I got it right. So, um, but there's always been that thought that there was horse trading, which is people were trading in a vote. So, because they didn't find him guilty on the mutilation. And people thought that maybe they did that because they did, they weren't committed to his guilt. So they're like, right, I'll, I'll do this and we'll trade for that one. But Dean just summed it up. It didn't really matter if he was found not guilty for the mutilation. It was that first account of murder itself. That was the account he had to be found innocent of because that is the ultimate sentence for the rest of your life. And... And I say that's the awakening for me was I always considered how would of the jury trading votes affected the outcome. I now see it for what it was. It didn't. Because as long as he was found guilty in the first account of murder of Teresa Holbach, his life was over. It was done. They won. Correct. And I, I think that's really powerful when you really break that down, when you really understand what Dean's saying. This was the end of the end if he was found guilty and he was yep i think it was a big i agree with you kelly i believe it was a very big strategic game and there was trading going on you know you think about it this is truly unbelievable they dropped the charges um against stephen right um and the jury found him not guilty for mutilation of a corpse then if you do the flip side, all the things that Stephen Avery wasn't accused of or found guilty of, 
Brendan Dassey was. Brendan Dassey was found, um, he was convicted and charged of mutilation of a corpse. So they flipped it. All the things that they dropped for Stephen, Brendan Dassey was convicted for and charged. It's rather remarkable, isn't it? So what are they saying? How did Stephen Avery kill Teresa Horbach? How did he do it? If they drop uh, all those charges, you know, of uh, being pinned up in a band, being um, held against her will, how did he kill her? Shot in the head. We don't know. That's it. So what did he do? Chase after her or something? The whole thing is completely crazy, right? But Kratz knew, the state knew, that if he was guilty of that one charge, that's it, lock away the keys, throw away the keys. Correct. It was a strategy and it worked. Absolutely, it did work. And so did you guys today, uh, putting in your uh, work today at the podcast, especially thanks to you, Kelly, uh, for the blood experiments. And uh, um, I guess that comes to the point where we have to do the wrap-up comments. And so... I will uh, hand the floor over to Big Jeff for the uh, beginning of wrap up. Well, thanks, Jeff. I, I have to say, uh, and this this is an easy wrap up for me because I have to say, uh, what is this our seventeen eighteenth podcast now? Uh, it, it, whatever, whichever, whichever number it is, this this seventeenth podcast. This this is by far uh, the podcast which I personally have learned the most. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Kel for the for the blood experiments because it is really really eye opening uh, when you see what what, what she just performed uh, and it, it, I, I don't even know what what to think about it now and uh, you know some of the things that I had just simply taken for granted uh, you know she's really made me do a double think on and that's ex that's exactly uh, what we want to do in this podcast uh, what is, what is the new evidence and, and please make people think. Uh, so th thank you for that, Kel. Uh, thank you, Dr. Silkman, for answering my, uh, you know, pain in the neck questions about EDTA. I learned a ton. Thank you guys so much uh, for, for all that information. Well, I just want to say, I just want to echo Big Jeff and uh, just say um, how fortunate we all are. Um, the fact that we can have uh, Kelly, who's um, in the medical field and has a lot of expertise uh, working with blood and her experiments uh, have been uh, very illuminating uh, and I certainly have learned a lot myself. And it goes to show um, Kathleen Zellner's approach is uh, very much what Kelly did and that is you need to reproduce a crime scene. You need to convince a judge and a jury of what actually took place. Unfortunately, that didn't really happen uh, for Stephen Avery or Brendan Dassey. Uh, mainly due to a lack of finance uh, and the use of experts. Uh, and it goes to show that um, doing crime scene reconstructions are so crucial and so critical because it means that certain paths of inquiries can either be stopped and be debunked and you can focus your time on other areas. Uh, which are more likely to yield fruit. And I want to personally thank Kelly for doing these live demonstrations. And uh, I'm so thankful and grateful to be part of the, the panel here. I've certainly learned a lot. Thank you so much. This case, like Big Jeff said, you got to you learn and you're learning and there's so much to unpack and it seems like for a while there there's always new information whether it's relevant or not it's always good to of uh, to break it down and, and to really use your mind to think and that's what i did with my experiments and that's what i do in general in terms of this case i try to keep balance i play the devil's advocate i i try to when i think of something i think it right through to the end i think of every alternative scenario that could connect to it because i think that you have to you have to bring balance you have to bring fairness to your own arguments um 
and that's basically what I love about this panel and the people in the community and when they join us in the premiere and they're they're commenting is we challenge each other but it's in a healthy manner we you, if you sit, all thought the same then you could potentially not see things that are there that have been in front of us the whole time when you challenge someone's idea it's healthy because you might not try to convince them of your way but it might help you as an individual open up and see things differently as well and teach yourself things you didn't realize because once you close yourself in it can become really dangerous and I think um, that's what I think this panel really brings a really good dynamic the, the four of us um, we we bounce off each other really well I felt comfortable enough to do the experiments in front of you as you guys know I've been holding off for a while it's not because like I said there is a lot of content to go through and to really like make sure it all flows into a great pattern so I can you know deliver it properly but it's also because it's, it's scary I, I potentially did something that no one's done I've gone outside the box I've done experiments and they don't come to a conclusion and there's going to be people that will come back and say I would have done this differently and that's cool and, and I, I expect that and I, I say to people, if you guys think you can do an experiment like this, please do it. The more the merrier. If there's things that you guys can do and participate in, like even um, Eric Cozy did with, I remember one of his first videos when he did it with the cabinet. And they got like 36,000 views because people want to see it. You have to see things to understand things sometimes. And when I do these blood experiments, you know, there's terminology I can use that are quite sophisticated in terms of the medical abbreviations. And, and it's hard because I've got to remember that people don't understand that. And I try to simplify it. And when I simplify it, sometimes I think I dumb it down too much that it sounds like I don't even know what I'm talking about. But it's because I'm trying to make sure that you guys understand because you guys, I want you guys to come on the journey with us. And that's basically um, where we're at. So thank you very much for allowing me to do it and um, I'll see you guys next week. If I could just make a quick comment, uh, Kelly, you acted impartially, right? You weren't thinking like a truther. You weren't thinking like a guilter. You did it and no matter how the results fell out, you reported them and we saw them live. You had no influence on the outcome of the results. And that's exactly what everyone has been crying for, fair forensic testing. Wherever the chips may fall, that's how they fall. If you come up to a specific conclusion, that's how it is, right? None of mm -hmm. this um, trying to bend the experiments to show <laughs> one particular thing, right? The way they fell out is the way they fell out. And that's why I, you have my utmost respect. That's awesome here, here. You, and, and that's exactly just to quickly close that off is that's exactly how i did my experiments i didn't try, and i mentioned it before i didn't try to force any narrative i didn't try to force it one way or the other if it would have come out one way and i was disappointed it would have just been that i would have been like fuck but it's just what it was it is what it is and that's why i did a lot of it on video because i wanted to prove that there was no altering or docking or any influence it was just how it felt is how it felt how it was able to be played with how everything was in video format um then when i went back and watched the video i realized when you're sitting there and having the video um for eight hours just watching blood dry i don't want to get on a presentation and just show you guys eight hours of just sitting there watching this blood so that's what i'm saying in terms of yes when i do finally present it there will be editing to it but not in the way that it will influence the results but more rather than just cutting it down to get to the point basically. Well, I think you definitely got to the point today. And I think it's at that point uh, in the show where uh, we, where I uh, say thanks to everybody, all the panelists, uh, the people in the chat. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, still got that uh, feeler out there for Johnny Depp next week. Uh, haven't heard anything back yet. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, his, his people can be a little slow. He wasn't, unfortunately, <laughs> he was unable to join us uh, for this episode. Um, 
and, and but I hope to see everybody uh, at the next episode. Please like and subscribe. It's the easiest and most effective way to support the channel. It's also extremely cheap. Uh, you don't have to spend any money to do that. Uh, share it on your social media if you think your friends might uh, enjoy the podcast as well. And uh, a, a big round of applause to uh, all, all, all the panelists and, and the hard work that uh, was put in today. A uh, big uh, thank you to everybody out there. This has been Discussing a Murderer. <laughs>